Hello, my name is Dr. Natalie Betts, and I'm the Associate Director of the UW-Madison Master of Science in Biotechnology program, as well as an instructor at the BTC Institute. Today, I would like to discuss protein analysis and testing for the COVID-19 virus, as well as the vaccines that are currently in development. This presentation is meant to be an overview of some of the scientific concepts involved with COVID-19 and is appropriate for audiences with varying degrees of science background. For more in-depth information, I recommend the CDC and FDA websites, as well as the World Health Organization. There have been several tests developed to test for the actual coronavirus itself. These tests rely on the detection of the genetic information of the virus, which turns out to be RNA for coronaviruses. A nasal swab is taken and sent to a diagnostic testing lab where the viral RNA is purified and converted to DNA, and the subsequent DNA is detected through an amplification process that labels the viral DNA with a fluorescent tag. The presence of this tag over a certain threshold indicates coronavirus was present in the original nasal swab samples and that that person was infected. If no fluorescence is detected, then the test is negative for the virus. This test is very sensitive and accurate, but can be time consuming. Future tests will focus on determining if someone has been infected in the past instead of currently infected. These types of tests look for antibodies in the blood that are against the virus. Scientists around the world have been involved in performing research to understand many aspects of COVID-19. They research how the disease happens, how can we get infected, and once we are infected, how does the disease, the disease progress? They also research how our body reacts to the infection and the disease, what symptoms are there, and how can we treat these symptoms effectively. In addition, Scientists are investigating how we can pre prevent the disease and if, and if a vaccine can be effective at preventing infection or reducing the severity of an infection. Doctors and epidemiologists have investigated different ways to mitigate infections by implementing various public health measures and treatments. Let's discuss some of the key features of the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. The image shown here is a presentation of the three-dimensional molecular structure of SARS-CoV-2 virus. The red triangular structures projecting from the surface of the virus are the viral spike protein, which I will discuss further later in this presentation. As mentioned earlier, when discussing the diagnostic tests for coronavirus, I mentioned that the genetic information is carried as a single strand of RNA. This is true for a large family of viruses that infect different animal species. Sometimes viruses can cross species barriers and then cause illness in humans, ranging from the common cold to, to more severe diseases such as SARS, which was present in 2002 through 2003, MERS, which erupted in 2012, and the present COVID-19 virus. Before we move to discussing more details about the molecular structure of the coronavirus, let's consider what a protein is. Proteins are composed of amino acids, and the order of amino acids in a protein is coded in the DNA, which is communicated from the nucleus of the cell to the cytoplasm by an RNA messenger. This messenger RNA is then translated into a protein in the cytoplasm of the cell on ribosomes. The virus infects the host cells, such as human cells, by the viral spike protein binding to a, t to a cellular protein called ACE2. According to recent research, a mutation in the original coronavirus probably occurred in late November of 2019 that triggered the jump from an animal host to humans. Zoonotic diseases are very common, both in the United States and around the world. Scientists estimate that more than six out of every 10 known infectious diseases in people can be spread from animals, and three out of every four new or emerging infectious diseases in people come from animals. Mutations in the viral genetic information can also help explain potential disease relapses where a patient can become reinfected with the virus. The spike protein on the surface of COVID-19 attaches to the ACE2 receptor on human cells particularly in airway and lung epithelial cells. This interaction between the spike protein and the ACE2 protein seems to be critical for infection. 
How might we think about this as a possible way to develop, to develop treatments for the virus? Drugs that could interrupt this interaction could treat or at least reduce the effects of the infection. The COVID-19 molecular structure is depicted here with the spike protein on the surface shown in yellow, the viral RNA and associated N protein shown in pink with the smaller HE protein shown in blue. The red structure is the viral membrane that protects the viral RNA until a virus has infected a cell. There are two types of immune responses, innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Innate comes from the Latin words in, which means in two, and nasi, which means to be born. Innate immunity is the natural immunity present in many organisms. All animals possess this defense mechanism. Adaptive immunity is also called acquired or cell-mediated immunity. Only vertebrates possess adaptive immunity, which is an additional powerful defense mechanism to overcome pathogens which evade or overcome the innate immune system. Innate immunity is readily available to protect the host from foreign invaders, which contains proteins that look foreign to our cells. These foreign proteins are called antigens. The innate immune system kills or removes antigens from the host. Granulocytes are a particular type of white blood cell. The three main types of granulocytes are neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. Neutrophils account for more than 50% of the white blood cells. Basophils, which contain heparin, an anticoagulant, and histamine, which promotes blood flow to tissues. Eosinophils play an important role in allergic reactions as well. Granulocytes have a short half-life, approximately five days, and are involved in the inflammatory response and dilation of the blood vessels in the site of infection. Macrophages are named from the Greek words macro for large and phagine, which means to eat. Macrophages are found in tissue or at the sites of infection. They recognize, engulf, and destroy antigens, cleaving them and presenting parts of the antigen on their surface. Dendritic cells, which can also process the antigen, present parts of the antigen on their surface to T cells. As you can see, the immune system is very complicated. The adaptive immunity system results in the development of antigen-specific T cells and B cells. These T cells and B cells are specific to the invading antigen because of how the macrophages and dendritic cells present parts of the antigen on the surface to these cells. B cells can produce antibodies that recognize the antigen on the virus or pathogen and allow for its removal. These antibodies can also block the ability of the virus to bind to surfaces of cells preventing infection. The antibodies made from activated B cells can neutralize and remove pathogens from the body. They can also identify and remove our own body cells that have become abnormal, such as in cancer. As mentioned earlier, the immune system recognizes pathogens by the unique antigens they present. Our immune system is trained to recognize self from non-self. When this system goes out of balance and malfunctions, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and lupus can occur. Once a person becomes infected with a pathogen, virus, bacteria, or parasite, the body produces antibodies to that particular pathogen. These antibodies remain in our system and can be detected using specific types of tests. It may take days to weeks for a person to begin producing antibodies at a rate that can actually be measured. An antibody test is critical to identify those who have been infected with COVID-19 and have recovered, and they can also help scientists determine how long a person has immunity and whether we can become reinfected with the virus again. Antibodies that are produced against COVID-19 are a potential therapy for those who are infected and experiencing symptoms. Studies are under underway to determine the efficacy of these antibodies. This therapy is called convalescent plasma, which I will discuss more on the next slide. Convalescent plasma that contains antibodies to pathogens is a therapy approach that dates as far back as at least 1900, when it was used to treat diphtheria. It has also been used to successfully treat influenza, 
Ebola, and the SARS and MERS coronaviruses. Research at several institutions continues to investigate the efficacy of this kind of treatment, which has received emergency use approval from the FDA. Doctors are trying to determine how much antibody is produced after infection with COVID-19, how much antibody is needed for therapy, and how long, the immu and how long that immunity will last. In some instances, our own body's immune system can actually make the infection and symptoms worse. This happens when a person's immune system overreacts and causes a runaway response which induces cell damage. This is often called a cytokine storm and can be quite serious to the patient. Strong, you know, strong immunosuppressive drugs are often used to dampen this overactive immune response. New protein tests are being developed to measure the level of antibodies in a patient's blood and whether this level is protective. These new protein tests can identify individuals who have had the infection and who are hopefully now immune. This is opposed to the RNA test I discussed at the beginning of the presentation, which only detects an active COVID-19 infection. Early in the pandemic, the need for a diagnostic test for the COVID-19 virus was critical. So researchers worked very hard to develop several different tests that the FDA tried to quickly authorize for use by relaxing their normally very stringent acceptance criteria. Being able to detect and track infected people was so very important to understanding the spread of the disease across the globe. Some of the early tests were not as accurate as the current test and not as sensitive or specific. Thus, the early tests were seen as the wild west for test development. The University of Wisconsin in Madison has played several key roles in research on the COVID-19 virus and potential treatments, such as how to stop the cytokine storm or use convalescent plasma to decrease the severity of the disease. In addition, researchers are working on developing vaccines to the virus, which has, which has involved several strong partnerships and collaborations between the university and local biotechnology companies. Many of the COVID-19 tests are completed in Madison, as well as many of the reagents needed for the test are also manufactured in Madison. Let's consider what might be involved in developing a vaccine for COVID-19. There are four principal types of vaccines that could be used to prevent COVID-19 infection. Live attenuated vaccines are a weakened version of the pathogen. The vaccines used for measles, mumps, and rubella, called the MMR vaccine, and the chickenpox vaccine are attenuated vaccines. Killed or inactivated vaccines are a destroyed version of the pathogen. Examples of killed vaccines are those used for the flu and for polio. Toxoid vaccines contain a specific toxin or chemical made from the virus or path pathogen that can elicit an immune response. Examples of toxoid vaccines are those for diphtheria and tetanus. Finally, synthetic vaccines have been developed with the help of biotechnology. These are engineered pieces of the pathogen that can elicit an immune response. Examples of synthetic vaccines include the Hib vaccine for Haemophilus influenza type B. While we can be infected with many types of viruses, bacteria, and parasites, we do not have effective vaccines to combat all of them. Why is that? Pathogens evolve along with our immune system, so they continue to develop ways to trick us. Some proteins often have reduced immunogenicity, so our immune system doesn't recognize their antigens very well. Some pathogens can hide or exploit the immune system, and others can mutate their antigens to evade our defense mechanisms. Humans have, been, humans have been evolving along with pathogens for hundreds of thousands of years, so this will always be the challenge of being able to effectively fight them. There are several vaccines in development by several companies around the world to try to combat COVID-19. The first vaccine to reach clinical trials was from a company called Moderna. Their vaccine uses mRNA to cause the body's cells to express and present an antigen that will stimulate antibodies against the virus. This mRNA contains the coding information for the COVID-19 spike protein. This is a new approach for vaccination and currently untested. 
Other candidates are following more traditional approaches, using actual inactivated virus or viral proteins themselves. Coraflu, which is, being, which is being developed in Madison, uses an engineered flu virus that tricks the body into thinking it's infected with COVID-19, which triggers an immune response, but since the virus cannot replicate, you don't get sick. For more information on COVID-19 and the vaccines in development, I, I highly recommend the vaccine tracker from the New York Times. For any vaccine or drug to be authorized to be used in humans, it must go through a stringent development process with several phases. Preclinical trials involve experiments in cell culture in animals to investigate the safety and does an immune response occur. Once promising findings have been seen in animal studies, the effect of the potential vaccine in a small number of people is investigated in what's called phase one. This is looking primarily for safety, dosage, and the confirmation that an immune response occurs. The investigation is then extended into phase two studies in which hundreds of people will be included. These studies may often include children and the elderly. Phase three efficacy trials are then performed on thousands of people to compare the efficacy of the vaccine to a placebo to determine if the vaccine is protective. Finally, if the results are good, then the FDA can approve the use and sale in the United States. Other countries have their own version of the FDA and this approval process. Currently, there are three leading vaccines and phase three clinical trials. I have included the companies involved with these vaccines and their mode of action. The data so far suggests that these vaccines are safe and show some early efficacy. Six vaccines are in phase one or phase two clinical trials. I have also listed the companies involved with these vaccines. You will notice that many of the vaccines in development are the result of collaborations between different companies and or universities. Other vaccines are, st are still in preclinical development. The U.S. Health and Human Services Department has provided funding at almost $5 billion to support research and manufacturing of potential vaccines. Viral mutations make vaccines and treatments for COVID-19 tricky. Scientists are still trying to determine if a person can become reinfected with the virus. That is, how long does immunity last? Will COVID-19 come back next year? probably, and especially if mutations occur that make the virus appear new to our bodies. This may be similar to influenza, which mutates rapidly and is sufficiently different to require a new vaccine every year. I hope that you have found this presentation concerning COVID-19 proteins, testing, treatments, and vaccine development interesting. I appreciate your attention and wish you all well.